Guys, thank you so much for your time, though. I really do appreciate it. Of course. Oh. So I, I want to jump in straight, and for all your films, basically, I'm wondering where the ideas start. Is it for the theme or the plot that drives where these scripts begin? Oh, you, you know, usually... It I would say it's almost always either theme. The thing we're shooting right now started with theme. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, by the way, that's why we look good. We're, we're oh, going yeah. directly from this to set in a sort of like the endless where we kind of wearing a lot of hats, including acting in it. But um, but like the movie we're shooting right now started with theme. Synchronic started with uh, with a concept. Um, the endless started with a theme. Spring started with a concept, <laughs> and resolution started with a concept. So it's like. Usually one of those, those things. Wait, where do the responsibilities get split though? Because if we look at credits, you know, we know you're co-directing, but Justin has you listed as being the writer and Aaron, you're de dealing with camera. Is it something a little more entwined than that than what we're led to believe? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the credits are, are a formality. We, we're just basically co-filmmakers, but there's a whole bunch of stuff to do. Um, and we, you know, we, I, he's heavily involved in the cinematography. I'm heavily involved in the writing. Um, it, it, it's, it's just much more of a, uh, uh, an umbrella concept of getting the movie made than it is the idea of doing each other's roles. You know? What is, what is the fascination, I guess, with, I mean, I'm not saying I, only three movies at this point that deal with time compared to the fourth, but, what is it about the time that makes it so in intrinsically interesting? Is it for, again, those plot devices or is it just being able to deal with messing with people's perceptions? Oh, I hope this answer isn't too simplistic and too shallow. But I think some of it is because when you're dealing in the realm of science fiction and even though it's, it is very fiction and you know, it's, it's not meant to, it's not meant to, um, <laughs> like an actual proponent of any kind of actual scientific theory. We're perverting science quite a bit to make our fiction. But that said, when you look at re like real scientific theories, it seems like that the ones that are the most interesting and the ones that tickle the imagination the most typically do have to do with time. You know, like whether it's Einstein's special relativity or it's the, the perception of time dealt with in synchronic, those are things rooted in actual science you would have and, you know, early semesters of physics or whatever it is. And those are the things, the theories that you never forget uh, going forward in your life. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of that, but there's also, we could steal a great quote from Linklater. What is it? Which is very true. Oh yeah. Um, this is actually, <laughs> it's a, it's a uh, somebody wrote this about yeah. Linklater, which is, uh, and we, we, would, we would pray somebody would ever write this eloquently about us, but it was um, uh, a lot of movies deal with how people move through time. But Linklater's movies deal with how time moves through people, mm. uh, and especially true, of course, of Boyhood in the before um, trilogy. All of these movies that uh, that that we've been making, um, they they deal with time through the prism of normally a, a central relationship and how that affects it. So, well, I think that's the other thing. I think there are plenty of people who will sit and watch any movie and just grasp onto what the plot is compared to where obviously you're dealing with your relationship, not just between two guys here, but you know, between his family, you know, his friend and, and their daughter. Is it something that you feel maybe sometimes you have to guide people through a little bit more than you first expected when you started writing the script? Hmm. You know what, I think that the answer is that, that is yes, right? Yeah, yeah I, think, I think we definitely had to, uh, I think we definitely, uh, <laughs> yes, I suppose is the answer. <laughs> yeah, we did. Uh, we did find ourselves having to, um, th th there's a whole bunch of things in Synchronic, and we did find ourselves having to, to make, basically make sure that we navigate our way through each of the very, very, very many threads in that movie, and also make sure that uh, at some point near the end, uh, they, all, they all come together in some way, Wh whether or not they resolve in a the way that is satisfying to you is, is subjective, of course, but, um, but all those many things ultimately at one convergence point in the movie uh, are dealt with. I'm, I'm also wondering, it's interesting, because obviously this film was made and planned way before the current situation we're in. 
but I find it interesting that your protagonist is so selfless and that's something that we're dealing with people not being able to be right now. And I'm wondering kind of where, is, as you kind of watch the movie in this time frame, has it changed a little bit for what you were planning for now that we're in this situation? Yeah, I mean, well, well two things. One is the script was originally written in 2015. Um, I mean, think about that. 2015, Obama was president. 2018, uh, very different world from 2015. Uh, <laughs> 2020, whoa, like, like things, things have changed so much in all these different time periods. Um, and then, and then in turn, so that's how do you, it's weird. You can't anticipate it, but it is bizarre to think about like how differently this movie would be received or interpreted whether, whether it had been released when it was written in 2015 or when it was shot in 2018 to today. Um, people will probably see it very differently. The world's changing so much, so fast. Um, and the other thing about, um, like, these two guys, these two characters in the movie, Steve and Dennis, is, yeah, like you said, like, Steve is very selfless, but, I mean, I would say these two characters are really flawed people. They're, they're very flawed. Um, I, you know, you hope as a filmmaker that because you cast two really charming celebrities that you're not endorsing the behavior of these, these two characters in a lot of ways. Um, but you also hope that in the end, that despite all their flaws, that you see the humanity in them and you see that they're ultimately good people. And that's what we were going for. Uh, and I'm happy, we're very happy to hear you say that, like, yeah, you, 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 you would define Steve as being selfless. Um, whereas probably at the beginning of the movie, you wouldn't define him that way. And that's, yeah. that's, that's lovely to hear. Well, what I think is interesting, too, is because you think about him as selfless, but at the same breath, I'm also watching him as a character who's basically being described as stunted in his adult life from everything from physically internally to what he's become. So all those things that make him great also are the things that are kind of holding him back. Yeah, and that's kind of what you're always trying to do with, uh, with your characters is make sure that their, their flaws are real flaws, but they're, they're also things that propel them through the journey um, and, they're, and the things that they're, they're proficient at um, are you never never going to be too good at it, you know? And that's that's why they're not super paramedics or anything like that. Um, they're 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 still very working class um, uh, individuals, um, and that's that's the balance, right? You want to make sure that you don't hate them, and you want to make sure that they're not gilded. Uh, and uh, it's it's a it's something you find in the script. It's something you find in performance, in casting, and it's something you refine again in the edit. I'm wondering, you know, I loved your vinyl record analogy, because I actually never heard that before. I don't know if you guys made that one up when you heard that somewhere, uh, for the needle drop, that is. And, and I'm wondering if there was also a lot of things that maybe I was either missing or I have to go back to see again that were more references. Like for instance, that first scene with them on scene as paramedics, watching that, that camera move and flow through, I'm wondering if that's supposed to be one scene, but every point you could possibly be in to see it or experience it, just like depending what point you are when you hit that needle drop. Yeah, I, I mean, it, in dealing with a concept like, like Block State Universe and the, you know, the, the idea, the concept of the movie of being like, well, the way I, Einstein probably saw time was that there was no distinction between past, present, and future, and that time mathematically would ultimately be directionless. Mm -hmm. um, all, all these ideas, and thank you for the compliment on the record thing. After we made this movie, we saw, um, we saw the uh, documentary adaptation on Nova, Brian Greene's book, Fabric of the Cosmos. And he uses this great analogy. He says, um, time isn't a frozen, time isn't a flowing river, it's a frozen river. Mm. And that, that seemed like a way better analogy than the record that we totally probably would have stolen had we seen it uh, before that. Uh, but if you, also to your question, if you were to rewatch the movie, yeah, you'd probably catch a whole bunch of things that were, just, just small details in and out, but also there, there were more, um, like we would think through like, okay, we're, we're trying to get across a very complicated concept and we don't have something as, as wonderful as Dr. Manhattan to describe it. Because essentially, I mean, it is the same idea as Dr. Manhattan in Watchmen, right? The way he sees the world, it's the exact same scientific theory. Um, but but we we don't have a Dr. Manhattan to tell us it. So how do we do all these things visually to like hopefully nudge the audience in that direction? And, and a lot of and I don't want to use the word subliminal, 
but but there is like places all over the movie where we're trying to like have a visual there were, there were parts where we're like we're gonna have like him describe it as rings of a tree or stuff like that and and like like what to put spray paint on the wall and the long wonder like which spray paint phrase would be the thing that would just yeah. nudge them towards that this theory that most people don't talk about or think about a whole lot i just don't know if sometimes i get caught up myself too much like for instance is the obvious one you're pointing where between the housings being 1170 and then 1107. But then later on, I think the next call, possibly even when they go to they learn about Brianna, I think it was like 106. I'm like, there's another one zero, a number in sequential. Is that supposed to be like that? Or am I just going crazy? <laughs> Pieces of it, yes and no. But also we don't want to, uh, we also have this wonderful production designer named Ariel Vida. And she, uh, she takes the script and thinks about it in that way as well. And so, the, like, what you just pointed out is definitely something that we did talk about, but also she'll be the kind of person that's like, that number of the hotel has to be 106. You know what I mean? She'll do that. And, uh, and she did that in The Endless, too. There are so many little things that I didn't even catch until she told us, and it's brilliant. So, yeah. I'm just thinking about the title, because, I mean, there, there's obvious ones people can jump right to, but the fact I can break it down into so many different versions of synthetic and then chronic for the more literal plot version of it, but then synchronized, chronological. I mean, I just spent like an hour trying to think of all the ways I can break that down and move that around. You, you just did a few yeah. more than we've ever yeah. done. <laughs> I definitely is synthetic chronic. You know, yeah. that's, um, that's <laughs> one I, I also love the idea that, um, you know, whoever the, the, the chemists making, making synchronic and they're like working with their graphic designer for the label for the headshot. And like the graphic designer's like sitting there at his desk and he's syncing his phone and he looks up at his frame, Dr. Gray's the chronic. And he goes, sync? <laughs> and moment. Yeah. And you just, that's it. That's the package. That is the package that's going on the shelf. Is there a point where you're worried about getting too involved in maybe the big studio system because you have so much control over your work now? And does that oh. worry you all? You just really want to no. you tell the story you're good. No, no, it's just because we can't get the job. Um, <laughs> we, uh, no, uh, honestly, um, we, we are happy to do both, very genuinely. Um, we we want to make sure that if we take a big job, which, you know, they, they do come, the offers come, mm. but, uh, but we want to make sure that we can really do it right and we're the right people for it and that we can get invested in it. Um, and uh, because, and while, while you parse all of that, I mean, we're still pretty new to this. I mean, we're not new to filmmaking. We've been doing that forever, but we, we only... Our first movie came out seven years ago, you know, I mean, so um, we got, we got some time, but, um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're very interested in doing much larger stuff. We just want to make sure it's right for us because that's not going to be a good fit for anyone if we just say yes. And then suddenly we're getting fired off of I don't know, something. So. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for all your films and for all you're doing in the time right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.